In this video, we will talk about random walks and unit root processes. This is FRM part 1, book 2, the chapter on non-stationary time series. Let's begin with a quick definition of a random walk. Your time series, let's say one which is denoted by y sub t, is said to follow a random walk if its process can be written down as y sub t is equal to the level of the time series in the previous period, let it be y sub t minus 1, plus the shock that has been experienced in the current period, let it be epsilon sub t. I am assuming that my shocks, they are essentially white noise, which means that they have a zero mean and they have a constant variance, let it be sigma squared. Okay, so all shocks, they have the same variance sigma squared. Also, let my shocks be serially uncorrelated. Okay, this is one way of writing down the process specification for a random walk. An alternative way to write down the specification for a random walk is to write it in terms of not its value in the previous period, but rather in terms of the value that we started with let it be y naught. So this is the value at time t equal to 0 plus the sum of all the shocks that have been experienced till date right from the first period where i is equal to 1 all the way till the current period where i is equal to t. Okay. Now if you were to recall the general specification for an AR1 process, that means an autoregressive process of the first order. For an AR1 process in general, I can write down the y sub t to be equal to a constant delta plus phi times the level in the previous period, so y sub t minus 1 plus the current shock epsilon t. If I were to compare the process specification for my random walk with the general template for an AR1 process, what it tells me is that my random walk seems to be just a special case of an AR1 process, a case where I have chosen delta to be equal to 0, see there is no delta here, and I have chosen the phi to be equal to 1. Okay? So this begs this question as to why this special case of an AR1 process needs a separate discussion of its own. Why do we have a dedicated video for random walks if all that it is is a special case of an AR1 process. Okay? Please note this that random walks they have properties which are markedly different from the properties of a stationary AR1 process. Let's try and dig deeper into the differences between random walks and a stationary AR1. To compare our random walk with a, a stationary AR1, let's pick an AR1 process which is as close as possible to our random walk. So let's you know, go ahead with a value of delta to be equal to 0. And let's pick a value of phi, first of all, whose magnitude is less than 1. I mean, absolute value of phi is less than 1. This will ensure that our AR1 process is indeed covariance stationary. And also, let's pick our phi to be as close to 1 as possible. So, for example, let's pick our phi to be, for example, let's say 0.98. Okay. Now, going forward, I will refer to this guy to be a random walk and I'll refer to this guy to be a stationary AR1. As we did in the case of a random walk, let's write down an alternate specification for our stationary AR1, which is in terms of the value that we started with, that means the initial value, and all shocks that have been experienced till date. Okay? This alternate specification for AR1 comes out to be this. 
okay so y sub t in the current period is equal to shock in the current period plus phi times the shock in the previous period plus phi square times the shock two periods ago all the way till the last term is phi to the power t times the initial value of phi that we started with okay if i were to compare these two now what do you observe okay you will observe that in the case of a random walk we have equal weights being assigned to the initial value of y and the shocks that have been experienced till date okay so the initial value of y and the shocks till date kind of play an equal role in terms of determining the current value of y something which is not true in the case of a stationary ar1 see here we have 1 as the coefficient here we have phi then phi squared then phi cube all the way till phi to the power t for y naught okay this tells me that for a stationary ar1 as we let our process evolve with time y naught the initial value that we started with will play a smaller and smaller role in determining the value of y sub t why would that be the case because remember phi is chosen to be slightly less than 1 and if i were to raise this phi at higher and higher powers this coefficient sitting in front of y naught will diminish down to a zero and therefore for a stationary ar1 y naught will play a smaller and smaller role in terms of determining y sub t something which is not true for the case of a random walk the same applies to any given shock in any given period if there is a shock which is a very extreme shock then that shock would be kind of forgotten as time passes by our stationary ar1 process but our random walk will never be able to forget that extreme shock that extreme shock will kind of you know create a permanent dislocation in the path for our time series okay this is our learning therefore the learning is that in the case of a random walk yt depends equally on y naught and the shocks experienced till date okay now let's do this let's try and compare our random walk with stationary ar1 process in terms of the unconditional mean and the unconditional variance of yt in the case of ar1 the expected value of yt which is its unconditional mean can be written as delta divided by 1 minus phi since we are working with a delta of 0 it means that the unconditional mean for our stationary ar1 will be equal to 0 the variance of yt for our stationary ar1 is simply sigma squared which is the variance of any given error term divided by 1 minus phi squared okay now coming to our random walk what is the expected value of y sub t i would want you to use this expression for y sub t the expected value of y sub t would simply be equal to y naught because that's a constant plus the sum of the expected values of each of the shocks and we know that our shocks each of them has an expected value of 0 okay so it will be y naught plus 0 which tells me that the expected value of y sub t in the case of a random walk is equal to the y naught that we started with okay what is the variance of y sub t again take a look at this expression y naught is a constant it does not contribute to the variance of y sub t epsilons they all have the same variance which is sigma squared and epsilons are serially uncorrelated so the variance of y sub t would simply be equal to t times sigma squared okay so this is t times sigma squared we have t shocks each one of them has a variance of sigma squared there is no covariance to worry about and hence variance of y sub t is t times sigma squared okay now if i were to compare these two boxes it tells me 
that a stationary AR1 process, it has a stable mean, see the mean does not depend on time and it has a stable variance. The variance also does not depend on time. But in the case of a random walk, although the mean is stable, it's y not. it does not depend on time, variance is not stable. Okay, it depends on time and it grows with time. So, if t were to approach infinity, so would the variance of y sub t. Okay, because of this reason, therefore, you should remember this that unlike our stationary AR1 process, random walks are not covariance stationary. Now, all that we have discussed till now, let's very quickly see these learnings more visually. So, what we've done here is that we have plotted a few paths for our stationary AR1 process and also for our random walk process. Okay. Now, if you were to pick a path from this plot and a path of the same color from this plot, then any two such paths which have the same color, we have ensured they share the same initial value and the same set of shocks, which tells me that the only difference between any two such paths of the same color would be the choice of phi. In this case, it will be 0.98. In this case, it will be 1. Okay. So, what do you observe from these set of paths? In the case of AR1, what you first and foremost observe is that all paths, although they start at this initial value of 50, all paths, they in some sense get attracted towards the long run mean level of this process, which we have found out to be equal to zero. Okay, Paths, they get attracted towards this long run mean level of zero. And once they have been sufficiently attracted towards zero, they then start to you know, cross zero again and again. Okay, So, this is the first thing which we observe and that is paths, they show mean reversion towards this long run level of zero. Okay, The same aspect, if I were to take a look at for these paths, again, all these paths, they start at the initial level of 50 and that 50 stays to be the expected value of y sub t at any given point in time. Okay, There is no you know, mean reversion happening here. The expected value of y sub t at any given point in time stays to be the y naught that we started with. Okay, The next thing that you should observe is that paths in the case of my AR1, they kind of stay within some kind of a band. Okay, the dispersion of my paths about this long run mean level of zero kind of stays stable with respect to time. Something which we already have established here. The variance of y sub t does not depend on time. Okay, in the case of random walk, what do you observe? You will observe that the dispersion of my paths about this mean level of y naught seems to be growing with respect to time and this is something which we've already established here okay variance of y sub t is t times sigma squared okay so although phi was 0.98 here and phi is 1 here values which are very close to each other these two values of phi create quite different properties for the paths that result from the choice of the phi Okay, next let's talk about unit roots. So, random walks, they are a special case of the more generalized unit root processes. Okay, why is that so? Let's very quickly take a look. This is the logic, the process for a random walk y sub t is equal to y sub t minus 1 plus epsilon t. If you are aware of the lag operator, then I can write down y sub t t minus 1 to be a lag operator L applied to y sub t. The job of this lag operator 
is to introduce a lag of 1. Okay, so L applied to Y sub T produces Y sub T minus 1. Okay, so Y T is equal to L Y T plus epsilon T. If I were to take this guy on the left hand side, then it gets me Y T minus L Y T is equal to epsilon T. If I were to write this guy in the form of a distributed lag, it tells me that 1 minus L applied to Y T is equal to epsilon T. This is my distributed lag polynomial. Now, if my distributed lag polynomial looks like this, 1 minus L, and if I were to convert it to an equivalent characteristic equation, then that characteristic equation will have a root which is equal to 1. And that is why our random walk is called a special case of the more general unit root processes. In general, if I were to write down the process for yt like this, a distributed lag, okay, it's a polynomial in terms of L, applied to yt is equal to a distributed lag applied to the error term. This is a very general way of writing down, let's say, an ARMA process, an autoregressive moving average process. If I were to take this distributed lag polynomial and try and factorize it, and let's say factorization of this guy does give me a 1 minus L and a remainder polynomial which is lowercase phi as a function of L, then it's truly the case that Y sub T follows a unit root process. Okay, very quickly let's take an example. If Y sub T is 1.6 times the y in the previous period minus 0.6 times the y two periods ago plus a current shock then first and foremost I can write this guy using the lag operator to be L applied to yt minus 0.6 times this guy would be L applied twice to yt so L squared applied to yt plus epsilon t. Again, if I were to gather the terms involving yt on the left hand side and write a distributed lag polynomial, it will get me to 1 minus 1.6 times L plus 0.6 times L squared applied to yt is equal to epsilon t. Try and factorize this distributed lag polynomial. It gets factorized as 1 minus L times 1 minus 0 0.6 times L. Okay, This tells me that there is indeed a 1 minus L coming in here, which tells me that this yt indeed follows a unit root process. Okay, This video was all about understanding what is a random walk. What properties of a random walk make it different from a general stationary AR1 process? Why is a random walk called a special case of the more general unit root processes? And given a specification for YT, how can we quickly detect if YT is indeed a unit root process or not? Okay.